Good evening, everyone. Um, a few housekeeping items to take care of first. Um, one, I would like to mention that our presenter tonight, Marlon Blackwell, will be back in Omaha on October 2nd and 3rd. He will be the jury chair for the fall conference. So please come and, and maybe introduce yourself and say hi to him, and hopefully you can catch him again in October. Second, AIA Omaha has a tour of the UNMC Turleson Eye Institute, um, which was designed by Ali Pointer Macchiato. The tour is Monday, May 20th at 4 p.m., and you'll get one CEU for that tour. And I'll be sending out an email blast, hopefully, probably tomorrow, um, with the details of the exact location for that. So again, the, another tour. So on to uh, tonight's speaker. Marlon Blackwell was born in Munich, Germany in 1956. Raised in a military family, he has lived in various places, including Alabama, Florida, Montana, Colorado, and the Philippines. He was a high school wrestler and unsuccessfully wrestled a bear in 1973 before attending Auburn University in the summer of 1974, where he studied architecture. During this time, he traveled and studied colonial and pre-Columbian architecture in Mexico and Guatemala. To put himself through college, he traveled through the rural south as a Bible salesman for five summers, and in 1976 was presented a top 20 sales award by the then presidential candidate Ronald Reagan. After graduation, he worked for several firms in Lafayette and Boston until 1990. During this time, he also spun records as a club disc jockey, further developing his love of rock and roll, and in particular, punk, rockabilly, and blues. In that same year, he attended graduate school at the Syracuse University Masters of Architecture program in Florence, Italy. In the fall of 1991, he, <clears throat> he accepted a visiting teaching position at the Architectural Design and Drawing at Syracuse. In 1992, he accepted an appointment with the School of Architecture at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, where he currently serves as Distinguished Professor and Department Head in the Faye Jones School of Architecture. In 1994, he founded the University of Arkansas's Mexico Summer Urban Studio, where he is coordinated and taught in the program at the Casa Luis Barragan in Mexico City since 1996. He has also led several foreign study tours to Guatemala, Peru, and Yemen. Also in 94, he married Ati Yohari, an architect in her home country of Malaysia, and together the two, they have two children, Zain and Iman. His five-person firm, Marlon Blackwell Architect, is located in the downtown square of Fayetteville. Work produced in this office has received recognition with numerous national and international design awards and significant publications in books, architectural journals, and magazines. The office was recognized as Firm of the Year by the Residential Architect Magazine in 2011. Recent honors include St. Nicholas Eastern Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arkansas, winning the 2013 AIA National Honor Award and a 2011 Civic and Community Building category at the World Architectural Festival in Barcelona, Spain. The significance of his contribution to the design is evident by the 2012 Architecture Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the publication of a monograph of his work entitled An Architecture of the Ozarks, the works of Marlon Blackwell, published in 2005. In 2006, Blackwell was selected by the International Design Magazine as one of the ID40 undersung heroes. Blackwell was selected by a national jury as one of the top 40 designers under 40 years old in 1995. In 1998, the Architectural League of New York recognized him as an emerging voice in architecture. He has been invited to give lectures on his work to many institutions, including the Architectural League of New York, MIT, Arizona State, Cornell University, Tulane University, Washington University at St. Louis, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and perhaps most notably, the outstanding group we have here tonight in Omaha, Nebraska. To relax, Marlon enjoys a good Cuban cigar and bourbon with friends. 
So, if you would, please help me welcome one of my favorite architects whose work has inspired many of us in this room, um, and above all, a genuinely good guy, Marlon Blackwell. Wow, I learned things about myself I didn't even know. Um, let's see, how do we get this to go back? Uh, God, Max, I just, I don't know what to think about him. Um, I have one, but, uh, well, thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, a lot, almost too much information, right? Um, anyways, great to be back. I was here about uh, five years ago, I think it was, uh, in Lincoln primarily. Really impressed with the school and the people that I met there and uh, had a good steak while I was here. It was also very good, so looking forward to that after the lecture little bourbon. Um, but I, I, I relish the opportunity to kind of come back and uh, share a little bit of the work that we've been doing in the last uh, five years. And we've grown a little bit since uh, Jay mentioned five. We've, we're now at about uh, nine people and we've moved our offices and I'll show you a little bit about that uh, later on. Uh, but we still continue to you know, live, practice, teach, and build uh, in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, you know, I like to I like Northwest Arkansas because it's the land of Bill, you know, and and a billion chickens, and you know the thing I love about the chickens, of course, are, I love these the chicken houses, you know, just how they dot the landscape, they articulate our landscape, and basically uh, I love the common sense that kind of comes with how they're oriented in the landscape. They're always oriented east west, uh, and the farmers knew that. They could minimize the sun exposure on the narrow ends of the east and west. They're 30, 40 feet wide by 600 feet long. And that way, by minimizing that sun exposure, they could, uh, you know, the chickens wouldn't cook before their time. Uh, so just, just kind of good common sense uh, uh, that we try to infuse in our own work uh, and something that I've, I've kind of grown to understand and love about the, the, the Ozarks itself. And, you know, when we were approached uh, back in 05 by Princeton Architectural Press, to, they wanted to do a monograph, and uh, we agreed to do it, although it's most of the, if you've seen the monograph, I think it's a very beautiful thing they did. Uh, it's mostly the early work. Um, but they insisted that, you know, we have an image, an iconic image of our place. And we've always thought of uh, the Ozarks as uh, an intersection of hills and valleys. And in particular, Fayetteville, where I live, uh, is the only town in northwest Arkansas that's built on hills rather than in a valley. And we're, we're just 10 miles outside of Tornado Alley. You know, so we watch the tornadoes kind of fly by and we're, we're pretty secure where we're at. But you can be in downtown Fayetteville and you can look out and see cows and chickens out in pastures and that sort of so You can see the countryside. So it's an interesting intersection. So we found this place in the valley and you can see, uh, if you squint a little bit, a building silhouette up on this hill. That's the main building on the University of Arkansas campus. Uh, we found this wonderful cow here with its, her baby calf. And you know, we're thinking about education and agriculture and how they intersect. And just as we went to take the photo, a Walmart truck drives right through the middle of it. And it's like, oh yeah, we forgot about commerce too. And of course, you know, we're in the home of the Ozarks. We're also the, you know, the capital of, of Walmart and Tyson Chicken and all these uh, major uh, corporations that kind of fuel the uh, dynamic economy that we have in, in, in Northwest Arkansas. And it's, you know, it's a place that uh, is kind of located in the middle of nowhere and only recently it's been connected to everywhere. Because of these corporations, we have more direct flights to major cities than any other uh, area our size in the country. So you can get on a plane and fly direct to LaGuardia or LA or, or Washington DC or what, whatever. So we're, we're connected but we're also remote. And it's a place of real natural beauty of course, but it's also a place of real constructed ugliness. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't snicker too much, I've seen some of the stuff here as well. It's kind of <laughs> ubiquitous in a way. Um, and you know, very often uh, a place like Arkansas, a place like where I work, is considered aesthetically and culturally impoverished. Uh, in words like abandonment, exploitation, nostalgia, erasure, uh, they're all aspects of this place and they're just as real as its local form and natural beauty. And one thing I've begun to realize, having been here now for a, like, over 20 years, is that 
you know, this land of disparate conditions is become not just a setting for our work, but it's really become part of our work. Uh, and so we don't really see a negative in where we work. What we see is a deep source of possibilities and inspiration uh, in direct experience with the world as we find it. And, uh, you know, that's very important because it allows us to choose to stay and what we've been able to do is work deeply and we've been able to discover a way to turn over the under turn over the stone the rock and discover the underbelly of our place all the visceral presences and the expressive character that really informs and sustains our work there now i'm working from a conviction a very simple conviction that architecture is larger than the subject of architecture. So what we try to do is be really careful observers. We put on a wide angle microscopic lens to look at the world uh, very closely to generate ideas and actions that come from the concrete experiences of the everyday. And this happens between the ordinary and the extraordinary, between one's own personal history and the history of our discipline. Uh, you may recognize the building on the left. That is the Thorn Crown Chapel, the great masterwork of E. Fay Jones, who practiced for 60 years nearly in uh, Fayetteville, uh, winner of the AIA gold medal, I think, back in 1990. I think the AIA voted uh, this chapel as the fourth best building built in the U.S. in the 20th century. It's a fantastic building. I don't know if people have seen it, but if you ever come to Arkansas, please go see it. It's amazing. And, you know, teaching at the university, and we have lecture series, and we bring all kinds of architects from all over the world. We've taken Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Muron there. We've taken Liebskin. We, you name it, we've taken them. And they all react in this very visceral way to this amazing work. It is a classic. It operates, I think, at the highest level, architecture in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, now, just a few miles away, we also have what we like to affectionately call Milk Carton Jesus. Um, and he's part of what the passion play in Eureka Springs. Uh, and, you know, where they act out the uh, story of Christ with actors and they've managed to build uh, a facsimile of Jerusalem that's about three quarter inches thick out of painted plywood. Uh, very strange place. But they had designed this Jesus to be very tall and seen from miles. Uh, but the problem they ran into is that the FAA was going to require a flashing blue light on the top of his head <laughs> uh, if he was going to be that tall. So rather than redesign him, they just cut him off at the knees and pushed him into the ground. And so he has the proportions of a milk carton. And so th that's why we call him that, of course. But it, what I'm trying to illustrate here to you is the highs and lows of culture in which we operate between as a practice. And again, we don't see it as a negative. We're not interested in trying to resolve one to the other, but only to develop a condition of resonance between them. And as a result, it forces us to be very careful in our observations of both macro and micro conditions, uh, conditions that are geological, uh, conditions that are biological, and of course conditions that are always cultural. And what they allow us to do, what they've allowed us to do, is form the basis for a bottom-up process that allows us to amplify the small things that manifest the large things. So in this line of thinking, we can say in the words of the great poet William Carlos Williams, is that there are no ideas but in things. And I think as contemporary architects, it allows us to engage some very critical questions that we're constantly being challenged by uh, as we practice on a day-to-day -day basis in a place like Fayetteville. The number one uh, question is, how do we embrace the world without being consumed by it? And secondly, how do we enrich and dignify the experience of being in the world for those who engage our work? Those are ongoing questions that we try to address in every project that we do. Now, uh, Da Vinci uh, was uh, quite clear 
and I think spoke directly about making from our experience of things, our interaction with the world as we find it, uh, when he said, it should not be so hard for you to stop sometimes and look into the stains of walls or ashes of a fire or clouds or mud or light places in which you may find really marvelous ideas. So all we're trying to do is out of the muck of our own condition is find really marvelous ideas. That's it. And, and that's what we continue to focus our efforts on. And so what it allows us to do, uh, I think, wow, this is bizarre. Let's see, let's try that again. Here we go. How's that? Very sensitive, these Macs. Let me try that. Um, what I was going to say is what we find ourselves doing is choosing to work uh, and build between uh, the motivating forces of the everyday, the, the world as we find it. Uh, I think it's safe to say that most architecture isn't very good, and most good architecture is good enough for most days, but there is some architecture, some buildings, that need to rise above the everyday. And this necessarily challenges us to return to the significance of the everyday and to enrich it and revalidate it through the things that we make, through the way in which we draw upon uh, the world as we find it and reinterpret it, to rethink it uh, as an action. And of course, you know, this idea of the inadvertent meeting the purposeful uh, arises in a very strange relationships that are, are sometimes unfamiliar. Um, in fact, uh, it's a way of defamiliarizing one's relationship to, uh, you know, what you see on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that that can be achieved through a work of architecture. So I really see in many ways our task is the task of recreating strangeness, the strangely familiar. It's just an example uh, here about finding something and then how through a project we can represent it uh, in such a way that it is at once connected and disconnected from the place that it is a kind of form of productive tension. Uh, and what emerges uh, through this, this action is a way to revive and intensify our experience of form and place. So it, it really is what emerges, as I think, is an architecture of unholy unions. And these are things we're interested in, so we do a lot of mixing uh, through, through intersections of nature and culture and draw upon all aspects of life for inspiration, uh, not just what the history books tell us to do or, or the latest, you know, sort of performative criteria. Uh, and this really, in many ways, becomes a transmutation uh, of, of place. Uh, talk about transmutations as, you know, essentially that's the alteration of one species into another if you take it from a scientific point. But it could be alteration of a, one place to another. That it, it really is uh, maintaining and intensifying the presence of what is found and what is given. And so we look for analogies, we look for analogous relationships uh, that we can draw inspiration from. And when you've been doing this for a while and you start to build a body of work, uh, you can begin to look back and, and see uh, how those influences are worked. This isn't terribly uh, focused, but we began to look at progenitors in our work, things like typologies of the shotgun or the villa, or the emerging typologies like the trailer house uh, or a barn or a bridge, and how through an intersection with uh, certain types of uh, natural forms, that uh, new forms would arise uh, in, the, in the landscape, uh, a new ways of thinking about the form and then how they generate their own ideas. So one idea folds into another. It's a continuous project. There never is one project that's just different from another. There are different vehicles, but the project maintains similar and it's evolutionary and dynamic. And so we work between the ideal in the discipline and the more improvised uh, in, our, in our discipline. And, and we revel in that. And that has led us to, again, to approach types, whether it's natural types or, or constructed types, in, a, again, a very evolutionary and dynamic way. We don't get wrapped up in fixed types, like, well, it's got to stay this way, because that becomes about style. And we're, we're not interested in that. And with the projects I'm going to show you, they're all very different and yet at the same time very related. But it, it allows us to, you know, again, uh, look at the world in a special way. This is a, a, a house for a beekeeper. 
a, a, a structure in North Carolina for someone to extract honey from the hive uh, and bottle it, sell it. It's a $40,000 project. It's the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, it's been published all over the world. Every, you, I've been to Russia and people know this project, you know, or something. So it has that kind of power and it shows you what you can do for 40,000. People's SUVs cost more than this project. My photography, my photographer costs more than my fee, you know, so <laughs> there you go. But, you know, other types of projects like the, the Keenan Tower House where we look at the patterns and textures of nature and develop analogies, develop a system of articulation uh, for uh, a, a building type that we'd never truly encountered before, which is, you know, a tower house That's in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, a project which is our uh, proposal, well, built, but it's, a, it's an alternative, alternative to the typical suburban office building. And that, you know, everything doesn't have to look like grandma's house, right? It, it, whether it's a house or a business, right? Uh, you know, I, I always find that weird, these businesses that look like a house. I, I, you know, you wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, you get in your car, you drive to work, and you're right back at your house. I mean, it's like Groundhog Day every day, I would imagine like this. So, it, you know, there are alternatives that, that respond to the specificities of place, that respond to local craft. Uh, that respond uh, in, in any ways to the, the, the economic models that are in place uh, that are not seen as limits but uh, really produce possibilities. And, and projects like a traditional golf clubhouse that, you know, where we were challenged to make it uh, a contemporary building of its place for very, for maintaining the traditional rituals of the game. This is the Blessings Golf Clubhouse for John Tyson. Uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, all of natural stone and copper, you know, thousand year materials. Um, one of the most contemporary golf clubhouses uh, in the country built in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, and, and done, I might add, for $210 a square foot for just the building. It is a third less, it costs a third less than the average golf clubhouse in the country. And we took big box approaches to it. We got intelligent, I think, a little bit on how to detail it. And, you know, you, you get creative, you know, in your place when you get to know it. So we like working with pipes. We like looking at how uh, a project evolves. Uh, in this particular case, we were challenged to do a, uh, uh, a prototype house in Biloxi, Mississippi for Architecture for Humanity post-Katrina. A market rate house that can be reproduced, unlike the uh, uh, make it right houses that are being done, which are unicorns. They're $450,000 houses that are, you know, net zero, platinum, lead, who cares? Nobody can afford to build another one because everybody's getting $30,000 loans to buy them. You know, that's what they, that they're, they're purchased for. What we're after is something that could actually be marketed and could be repeated again and again. That was the challenge of this program. And we had to start. Uh, with a uh, shotgun type, uh, but we also had to address in an evolutionary way what had happened in the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, which is all new structures now have to be built anywhere from 6 to 12 feet you know, above the ground plane to accommodate the storm surge, uh, which is you know, what's you know, a lot, a lot not doing that and led a lot of devastation. Uh, and so, you know, very simply, we, we found a way to maintain the social connection, the porch, the ground level, which is very important in the urban fabric, and, and of course, uh, for social interface in this uh, part of the world, uh, and then elevate uh, the house, but rather than a bungalow on stilts that kind of creates residual space below, we cut it in half and stacked the program, and that evolved into what we like to call the porch dog. And so this was completed a couple years ago for about $130 a square foot uh, as a prototype. Um, and, it, you know, it. It's a way of looking forward, you know, with very common materials and, and strategies. But again, shows the dynamic evolutionary traits of a type that's not fixed. You know, uh, Biloxi was the only town in Gulf, the Gulf Coast uh, of Mississippi that rejected the new urbanist plan for that. They decided that not everybody wants to live in grandma's house with a geranium on the porch. That, you know, and if you don't believe me, you can look, this is what the new urbanist came up with over here. It's cute, it's nice, it won't be there in the next storm. Okay, so, through preaching, imitation, we'll be later in the, uh, okay. 
So I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you f five projects. I'm going to have a very quick uh, halftime. It'll last 30 seconds. Uh, commercial break. And then five projects. And I've just broken this, this, this uh, talk into looking at how nature, how environment, how site can drive a project to, to create this kind of hybrid condition between the typology and between one's negotiation with circumstance and how principle can overcome that. And then the last half, I'm going to focus it just on how we can do that, uh, how a building itself, an existing condition, can drive that project. Okay, so very clear and hopefully, but related. So I've never done this before. And let's see if I can get this to, it doesn't want to, doesn't want to switch. I just want to go to the next slide. There you go. All right. I'm starting with a project that's going to be built but hasn't been built yet. And this is a, a, a Episcopal church in Bentonville, Arkansas, not far from the new Crystal Bridges American Art Museum, um, that we were all excited about. It's uh, uh, not going to switch on me again. Did he go away? We can quote you on that. You would just start doing that. I'm just, I'm just clicking on the arrow. Oh, okay. Is it because the arrow's there? I'm not sure. It's totally dead. Okay, well, it's just going to have to be the arrow then. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, so this is in Bentonville, Arkansas. This is the new Crystal Bridges Art Museum. If you haven't seen it, and you go see it, it's amazing. Uh, the newest. Uh, American Art Museum since the Whitney. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, downtown Bentonville Square and in our site here for this new wonderful All Saints Episcopal Church which we're really excited about. And of course uh, having not done an Episcopal Church before uh, we uh, immediately started looking at the typology and the, how, how it's organized and the, the narthex and the atrium and all the different kind of components of it and imagining how an interpretation of that would fit on this site, you know, in a very kind of linear, kind of sequential uh, piece, which we quite love about this. Uh, unfortunately, when we started looking uh, at the site a little closer, it's like, wow, this is the Ozarks. We forgot about that. It's not a flat site. And it's got all this steep terrain, which is both beautiful and also very challenging to deal with. And we had things like access and parking and, and, and all of that. And uh, Let's see if this how this works here. And of course, you know the, the terrain is what's beautiful, but it's also uh, what's very challenging and how to get something on that. And so, just really quickly, we're looking at areas that are too steep to build on. Then we had to have parking. Then we had to have a driveway to the to the parking access, so you could get up the hill. And then there were areas that you couldn't really build on. And then uh, you know where it's coming, don't you? Um, <laughs> So that's what we got left, and we're like, holy shit. Uh, so our box don't fit in a triangle. Um, so we're, and we like to think of ourselves as the, you know, the kings of the dumb box. Um, so we were a little flummoxed there. And, you know, after relaxing and just thinking, well, this just causes for a reorganization of things. How the type is going to have to change. The site's going to drive this. So uh, I'm going to figure this out here in a minute reverse technology. So what eventually evolved uh, was a church that uh, totally, they're unlike anything in the Episcopal uh, uh, churches, uh, really responds very specifically to the site and uh, allows the site to be the driver rather than the type itself and produces perhaps maybe a new type with its parking and arrival sequence. And I'll take you through some of the thinking on that very carefully, very quickly. It sits astride the hill. And it's just, again, it's layered in a sort of axial and linear way. Uh, and we use the terrain uh, to uh, organize uh, all the spaces, which uh, with its atrium here and education wing on one side and parish hall administration above, we have a, an entry that embraces everyone. 
uh, a narthex with a sanctuary, and then this chapel and an open atrium at the end. So we would just fill up that entire uh, space. Uh, and, and of course, we wanted to adjust the scale to give it form, so we think about the human scale as you, as you enter and, and first are greeted by this uh, embracing uh, porch, 12-foot high porch that's over 100 and something feet long, and then it slowly shifts gradually up uh, back towards uh, uh, a more heavenly direction. I went backwards, there we go. And then we carved out, the, we made a landscape. We create that porch, like I was saying. And then we mark the entry, and that's where our administration goes. That's also where the major conference room is, right over that entry. Then we made a plaza where you could be dropped off. You can walk, cars occupy the same space, but it's, they slow down, they drop people off anywhere along there, so you, uh, a little dignity in terms of how you enter. Uh, and, and then, of course, we had to paint it red because uh, Arkansas's colors are red, too. So there you go. No, no, that's a tradition in the Episcopal Church is to paint their main door red. But we had 12 or 13, 14 doors along this wall, so we painted all red. It's just one big door as far as we're concerned. Um, and it's all clad in a very uh, ethereal sort of... Uh, uh, metal skin that's been perforated and the substrate is also white so you get white on white and 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 you get a very a kind of more ephemeral cloaked veiled almost look that allows this building to act almost like a jellyfish or be perceived like one so here we go that's it as you as you approach it uh, and then from the parking you approach and on Sunday See if this happened. Did it happen? The doors open? Did they open? Hey, all right. That's our form of animation here. <laughs> uh, so we again take it, working with the existing and kind of transforming that. Everyone gets to enter at multiple points. They try to break down the hierarchy. Uh, simple section cut through uh, that courtyard, which organizes uh, everything, becomes a place of gathering, place for solitude, place for fellowship. Uh, all the major educational spaces in the parish hall open onto that. It's filled with also their uh, uh, font is out there so that they actually go out to retrieve the water to take it back in. So images uh, of activity there. So we're trying to make, do our best to make good things out of the V up in the library looking down. Uh, another section. And then we decided that, that since this was going to be like a vitrine, like a, a translucent vitrine that you could see through like a jellyfish, that you could hint at what's going on in the church. Rather than closing the church as an inner world, and as churches often are, an inner sanctum that's cut off from the world, what if it were understood the world as a more liminal zone uh, between the church uh, and the world itself, and that, that somehow the presence of both could be felt? inside and outside. And so that's the approach. And so we began to figure the spaces in very uh, specific ways. Uh, and here's a model of that kind of uh, jellyfish look, how it lights up at night. And then we began to cut holes through the, uh, through the, the, the mass of it to create thresholds, uh, in this case, uh, into the narthex uh, and, and that choir loft and into the sanctuary here, and th this is actually a place too that we're hoping to be an extension of the Crystal Bridges Art Museum to display liturgical art. Uh, so it's both a church and a place for culture. And then into the uh, sanctuary, which is actually veiled in embroidered sheer curtains, uh, glass, both clear and translucent, then the me metallic veil, which creates layers of opacity and translucency and transparency. And then uh, the sanctuary uh, ends in this strange little chapel with a rhino horn oculus, so you don't see the sky. You only, it's really an ear rather than uh, uh, an eye. So unlike the Pantheon, you don't see directly, you just, it's as something, somebody much higher than you is listening. And then that's the small chapel beyond. So oh, we're gonna start construction next spring. Uh, so starting with a box, Find it with a triangle. And you know, you say lightning never strikes twice. Well, uh, happened again to us just recently on a Montessori school built in a floodplain. By the time we factored out all the flood zones and floodways and easements and all that, we wound up with another triangle. Uh, here you go, right here. So 
uh, we uh, had to figure out a way to get all the program in, which didn't fit in the triangle necessarily, so we spanned over that in the classrooms and uh, created two boxes, really, uh, and then a, a rain garden and a green roof on the top. And we're able to do this for like 200 bucks a square foot, just local cypress, wood, and, and metal uh, siding. Let's keep moving here. So here it is, just a kind of series of porches, intersecting boxes, the green roof, which becomes a nice educational tool. And then our favorite detail on this off-the-shelf system where we take this corner trip, which is one piece that goes from 60 degrees to 90 degrees all the way through and resolve it in a seamless way. So off the rack stuff that you can make feel like it's been crafted. It, when I was a, a student at Auburn, you know, I boasted to my roommate that I would never live uh, you know, or own a house, let's just say that I didn't design and build myself. And I thought, well, that'll happen when I'm 30. And of course, it didn't happen until I was 50. So I don't recommend this as, a, as an economic model because I, I rented the whole time up until I was 50. <laughs> not a good way to build equity. But this is our, our house near the city park in uh, uh, Fayetteville. It is a house that uh, we bought a lot for, uh, 9,000 square foot lot, trapezoid shaped lot with a creek that ran diagonally through it. So no one could figure out how to build it. In fact, it had never been built on in the 150 years that Fayetteville's existed. So uh, we rented a house next door, of course, and observed it for about a year and a half and came up with a scheme that involved bridging and stacking of forms uh, that would minimize the footprint of the house to maximize the availability of land, preserve the creek, uh, and also work with the scale of the one-story neighborhood that we were operating in, wood frame neighborhood. And we call this the L-Stack House. And you can get a sense of that here with the creek that passes through. These are two 18-foot wide boxes, that, uh, one spanning the creek, the other rotating back up in the air, uh, creating an outdoor, 1,000 square foot outdoor terrace below. And it's, both of the boxes are hinged together by a shear wall and a glass stair, a glass enclosed stair, so that perceptually you actually go outside to go back inside. Uh, into the upper part of the house. And you can see how it sits astride the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the creek. A great place to sit on the stair and watch the water rise during the storm. It's always got water in it, but gets up about three or four feet. It's pretty exciting. And for us, I would say that all elements, doors, windows, columns, things, are all potentials for spatial propositions that they can be the extension of a room, that they can actually be inhabited physically as well as perceptually. And so, uh, in this case, a window that you can actually sleep in, cantilevered over the creek. Uh, this was uh, designed in collaboration with my wife, Ati, and uh, this is a battle that she won, and it was a good one. I'm glad she won this one. But you, you kind of get, begin to get a sense of the bridging and stacking that goes on in the house. Um, and the key to all of this is that conceptually it's the L-stack house, two volumes that are independently stacked, not interlocking like a Lincoln log. So that means that the most important detail has to start right here. There's no margin of error. There's a three-quarter inch space. All detailing started from that intersection and worked backwards. And so it's one thing to say it conceptually. It's another thing to execute it so that it actually is consistent with the original idea. And I've seen a lot of these where they're just kind of interlocked because they didn't resolve the tectonics, the details. So what we try to do is front end our detailing early in the process so we don't get VE'd much. Our ideas don't get VE'd. The, 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 the assemblies might get VE'd, but the ideas don't. There's a, there's a huge difference. And we have a Cro-Magnon rain screen we like to call it because it's so labor intensive. It covered the whole house in rubber. and then covered the struts in rubber. We then uh, notched a jig that we could put one by two Brazilian redwood in, stack it like stone, toenailed it from below uh, with stainless steel screws. And then I painted, uh, paid a guy to paint each screw, 13,000 screws, black. <laughs> and after about a week, he finished. 
and then asks us to lose his phone number. <laughs> so inside is very open. You use landscape to complete uh, edges of rooms. Very simple. We use uh, Greek classical proportioning to refine the, uh, the building. Everything's uh, golden and stuff, but we don't start with that, but we use it to refine it. Uh, upstairs is pretty simple, but we use the circulation spaces as places to recreate and study for the kids so they get out of their rooms once in a while. But when they're in the rooms, they have spaces that they can conduct activities like uh, reading in the window, uh, you know, studying. My son's still traumatized. We're trying to change his, change his uh, underwear in front of the, uh, uh, the glass there. But, uh, <laughs> He, uh, we, we got him a remote screen that comes down, so he's hopefully, hopefully he's not scarred for my Okay, so again, a response to sight, a response to uh, the place that's a constant negotiation as, as a driver, and it, it produces, it, it, this is an architecture that I would argue resists theory, resists the exclusivity of theory, but really, drills down into dissimilarity and variety as an operational strategy. Uh, I rarely show this project, but we've just discovered on our website it's the most visited project on our website, so we thought, oh, I'm going to throw this in there. And this is a project that takes place at Falling Water. Uh, we were one of six finalists to propose six new uh, cabins uh, uh, for the 5,000 acre conservancy that Falling Water sits on. It's in a field located about a thousand feet, ab well, maybe not a thousand, but about 600 feet above falling water. So you don't see it, but uh, it's on the same property. We were brought out there in February in the snow with snowshoes to explore the site. This is how falling water looked when we, we saw it. Uh, and the, the site itself was an, an open field. Uh, again, falling water down here. Uh, an open field that was a pasture, an old farmhouse here, the Kilpatrick farmhouse, and we were allowed to work anywhere in the field or along the field. And uh, our strategy was rather than disperse all the different units around the edge of the field, was to cut no trees down to actually create a true fellowship between uh, the six uh, units and build them together one at a time to create a threshold uh, between the field and the mountain range, the Alleghenies beyond. And we were out there in the snow, and there's an old saying that if you don't have an idea in two hours when you're on the site, you're not gonna have one. So you better come up, you, you gotta think fast. So we just drew our scheme right in the snow when we were out there. Uh, so here's the idea, and then go back and we're gonna draw it up. Uh, and so that's how we approached it, that's how it, how it, how it came about. Beautiful field, as you see, that w this is leaving the Kilpatrick House, and we wanted to keep these pathways and allow them to lead uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the units that, uh, as the hill drops, they, 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 part of the field rises up on top as a, the switchgrass becomes part of the roof, and then it drops down and creates a sectional cut uh, in the cabins themselves. And at night, they, they light up like lanterns uh, across the field and act as beacons that kind of guide your way uh, as you leave the community house. And each of these uh, units has, of course, their own interior, uh, as well as an exterior that's almost the same size as the interior, a giant uh, porch. The west, the south walls that you see here are all made up of cordwood that's found in the 5,000 acre. So we're, we're cutting up basically hemlock and other types of found uh, wood and stacking it up to make the thermal mass on the south side. All geothermal. These are the lanterns, the thresholds that you move in. And we make models, of course, of every, every, all our models and renderings are done in-house. Uh, had my guy cut twigs for three days, kind of get that, get that nice texture. He got paid. That's the main thing. Okay. So, and uh, just some of the images of the house. So, you know, to support this porch, uh, we worked with the structural engineers that do a lot of work at Falling Water. And they figured out a way for us to support this entire porch on one column, apparently. Uh, it's actually three, but you only see one. And, uh, and really creates a great way of shading, uh, but also setting up the view to, to beyond. Here's the threshold down into the, into the house. And uh, 
again, it's uh, looking back up the hill. It's set on the geothermal, a closed loop system. So each time you build a house, you don't have to build a new mechanical room or anything. It's all tied into one system. So it's a community system. And again, it, it creates a place for fellowship. And that's the idea, the proximity, people coming and going, uh, a, a chance to, again, socialize, uh, but simultaneously uh, a place to retreat back into the house for solitude, for reflection, and still maintaining that connection uh, with the immensity of the landscape beyond. We didn't win the competition. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the winner was an underground scheme, uh, which, you know, I wouldn't agree to, and, and neither did the owners they, uh, of the property. They didn't allow it to be built. They were somewhat taken back by that strategy. It looked good. It kind of looked like, you know, Middle Earth. Uh, that's what you like in architecture. But uh, nonetheless, it was a great, great way to, uh, again, look at these ideas, look about the relationships of site, and draw inspiration from someone like Wright, who, you know, if he came at a site and you know, well, the first thing I'm going to do is go underground. I don't think we'd have falling water today. He took the bold, uh, the bold strategy, and, and now we have, I think, one of the, well, the greatest uh, a, a house, I think, a contemporary house in the world uh, in falling water. So the last project I want to show of this, this first half is uh, a recent project we completed at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Uh, for a 100 acre art and nature park uh, that we did in collaboration with Ed Blake, our landscape architect, recently passed away, and Mary Miss, an environmental artist out of New York. Uh, we worked for years on this, is how to convert uh, a wild landscape of 100 acres adjacent to the Indianapolis Museum of Art uh, into a place for site-specific art and nature, uh, and, and, and allow that to become uh, a mixing of art and nature and experience and interpretation. And this is the uh, 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 the site here where it's right on the edge of downtown Indianapolis. You can see the grid of Indianapolis if you've ever been there. Uh, and the estate or the campus, let's say, of the Museum of Art, it's in the oxbow of the uh, White River that runs through Indianapolis. Uh, and then uh, there is a uh, lake in the middle here. Now, it, that lake used to be a forest that then became a pasture that then became a rock quarry to dig limestone to build the interstates through the city. And now it's filled up with water and it's become a recreational amenity in the city. And, uh, and so we're, we're located somewhere right about in here and I'll tell you how we got there here in just a minute. So a uh, very, very distinct edge between two ways of developing the land. Uh, and we were asked to uh, propose a structure uh, for uh, respite essentially in the woods, a visitor center for assessment, interpretation, uh, and basically uh, relaxation. So we start with 100 acres, we take away the lake, uh, we have about 60 acres, and then we factor in the flood zones, the flood plains, the easements, the canal, all the other things, and we had 0.67 acres to build on. <laughs> so very easy to find the site. We had a choice of one or two, we took two up here in a woodland, no particular view, kind of a wetland. This is a very volatile site. They've had uh, essentially three 100-year floods in the last six years. And this is primarily because of indiscriminate development upriver, which really sediment and other things really changes the, the course and flow of the river. Uh, so what happens is uh, in, in a time of flood, it wants to, in this narrow strip of land, it breaches across here uh, and then comes and spills all the way up into here and then gets turned back by this loop they build, spills back into here and then breaches back over. So the, the river actually rises higher than the lake. Uh, and it's a, it's a strange phenomenon if you ever see it, and here it is. So the, the river is higher than the lake and it erodes and it's a very volatile relationship. And we had to figure out how to negotiate with this new structure, this condition between uh, land and water. Here's some of the different aspects of the, uh, of the place, uh, the different types of art and uh, places that Ed made and pathway journeys. And ours was really not considered our, our building or structure a destination, and the destination. It's just part of a, a series of pathway journeys. And our site, which is wet and fecund, uh, it's in the floodplain. 
uh, and as you can see what it looks like when it's flooded. So the big challenge was how to get it out of the floodplain, out of the forest floor, and it had to be nearly five feet. So a building on stilts at five feet at eye level is not desirable, I can assure you. So our landscape architect, he looked at our initial sketches, which were uh, really about trying to develop a very particular figure that I can explain here in a minute. Uh, but his idea was to lift it up naturally with mounds, almost like Indian mounds, figured mounds, these green mounds, uh, that allow it to seamlessly rise out of the forest floor three or four feet and then allow the building to sit astride that, just floating just above it like an apparition in the woods. Uh, and it was a, just a, a, a beautiful idea and then these points lead you to particular views out into the landscape through the trees. And so we looked at things uh, uh, like trees, uh, like the leaves of trees that have been eaten away by insects that we found on the site. And I love the porosity of the surface, and yet it was strong. You could see the veins of the leaf, the structure of the leaf, but the porosity. And the analogy here is like that of the canopy of the forest itself that allows for ventilated shade, that allows for light and water to come through it, but still cools and shades. Uh, and and the, another analogy, we looked at microscopically at butterfly wings. Uh, just looking at the root word of pavilion, which is papillon, you know, we, we found that, uh, you know, microscopically, again, the wing itself is something that's both strong and light was an analogy we could draw off of. So here, once again, nature, sight, begin to drive a project through careful uh, observation. So our idea is to develop one surface that could be folded out of one material with essentially one detail. So look closely, and, and this animation will show you exactly the idea here. Okay, that's it. If you want to see it again, I'd be happy to. So the idea, uh, there's the idea. So you unfold it, one surface that makes the floor, the wall, the canopy folds over, and the program is sandwiched in between. It's kind of like a tortilla. There you go. And then that leads to this project uh, here, which is the visitor center for the IMA. Very porous. Uh, light structure that light and water comes through. Uh, it is, uh, and then it has glass on top of the structure for where it's conditioned space. Uh, and then intensities of light that are figured into the system uh, of this, this uh, floating screens on the, uh, both the, uh, the floor and the canopy. And then it uses an exoskeleton, which you rarely see, steel exoskeleton, to hold all this into place. And to get it past the codes, we had to figure out how to deal with the deck, the spacing. So we filled the interstitial spaces between the boards with uh, UV rated uh, uh, acrylic bars. Uh, and that, of course, allowed light and water to go through, but also allowed you to light it at night. So this idea of the apparition uh, comes through uh, in the evening. It's kind of a uh, lit surface. And you begin to see underneath the, the lightness of the surface uh, and, 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 and thinness of it, and yet on top, the kind of heaviness, the bones uh, of this thing holding everything together. But you really don't experience, what, you experience the structure through its shadow, so it's an imprint of pattern through shadow onto the wood. And this is constantly changing because the light moves and the shadows move with it. A cloud comes overhead, the shadows disappear, it reappears in the sun, and they flicker back on. So this constantly pulsating uh, with the rhythms of the day and the seasons. And we use these long ADA ramps to rise up out of the forest floor onto the, uh, uh, onto the mounds uh, that allow you to sort of seamlessly leave the floor of the forest and go into the structure and be underneath it, both outdoor and indoor spaces. And the quality of light indoors is very similar to quality of light in the shaded porches. Uh, the interior is uh, while the wood that you see up above and on the floor, that'll turn silver over time, it ages naturally. We water popped the white oak, the rift cut white oak, and ebonized it. So it's, it's polished and it's much like the museum and a piece of that that broke off and came down, but it's sandwiched between this aging uh, husk. So an issue of time there. And there it sits in the, the landscape, the black box you see is all the services, the bathroom, the kitchen, offices, mechanical. That's all done out of shojibu, that's burned uh, cedar, and it's blackened, and it fire retards the wood. 
uh, and of course the wood we're using is also ironwoods, which has a fire rating of concrete. So it's a basically a fireproof wood building uh, in the woods. And a, an interesting kind of uh, phenomenon has emerged in this interstitial space between the husk and the box here. Uh, this little three foot space, not even quite three feet, is where uh, engagements are happening. People are making proposals in there for whatever reasons. So uh, it's a strange thing, about three or four have happened in the city and I guess weddings are next, so. Big enough for a preacher and to focus. And that's it. And uh, this is, uh, was the winner, I think last year, of the AIA National Honor Award. So it's our, our first award <coughs> at the national level for it. And really is a, is a project that begins to negotiate that relationship between nature and culture. Okay, half time, amazon.com. If you get this book, and there's not many left, you get an eight by 10 glossy black and white photo on the inside of a Bible salesman in Ronald Reagan <laughs> <coughs> from 1976. That's right, that's what Jay said. And I, I came from a very modest background. I had no money growing up. And the only way I could get through college was to find a job in the summer that allowed me to pay for the rest of the year. So I, I sold Bibles door to door through a company out of Nashville, did very well, and uh, managed to survive 70s fashion wear. Uh, and put my way through college. Now, just recently, about a month ago, you know, I met uh, somebody else I always wanted to meet, and uh, I, I said, you know, I got to talking to uh, him at an event in Fayetteville, and I, we got to talking about Bible. He knew more about Bible selling than I did. He used to he used to pick up Bible salesmen on the road and then try to buy him a car, uh, uh, to like a, a jalopy or something. And finally, I told Mr. Clinton, I said, I told him about the book and this picture with Reagan. I said, you know, I'd really like to have a, a photo with a Democrat, too. Uh, so he, he was all for that. So, we, so I've now I've got both sides, Republican and Democrat. So. All right, that was the end of the commercial. Catch your breath. Okay. Post-war, Fayetteville. There is a very famous family, I'm sure you've heard of, the Fulbright family. William J. Fulbright, Fulbright Scholars from Fayetteville, Arkansas. They owned a lumber mill and they made farm tools, plowshares, wagon wheels, barrels, all kinds of things. Uh, Post-war, those things were becoming less and less in demand. At the same time, there's another very famous architect from Fayetteville, Arkansas, who's building the country's first fine arts complex on the campus of the University of Arkansas. His name is Edward Durrell Stone. And he has an idea, he's friends with the Fulbright family, and he says, you know, what we could do to help is to help you repurpose these tools into an international line of furniture in which we could put in this building and we could market. And the Fulbrights liked that. So they took these plowshares and they started to turn them into, into these chairs and, and, and wagon wheels into benches. And they, and, they, and they used the local craft of basket weaving, basket making of the Ozarks to help make chase lounges out of these plowshares and, and, and local stripped white oak. And create a kind of convergence of uh, ideas about craft, early ideas about sustainability, right? I mean, I mean, that's ultimately, we hear this word all the time, but I think the idea of repurposing things is probably one of the, the best things that we can do. So the projects I'm gonna show you next have to do with issues of local craft, issues of repurposing uh, in existing spaces or uh, additions to existing buildings that allow them to perpetuate themselves into the future. In other words, providing the past with the future. Uh, the first project takes place literally at the Crystal Bridges Museum of Art designed by Moshe Softy. Uh, the Waltons wanted a local architect to do the gift shop museum store. They had a competition. We were fortunate enough to win it. Uh, and while this other structure, this huge uh, uh, structure is under construction, we're, we're designing our little gift shop. And so this is Crystal Bridges from above. Uh, and it's a series of figures and uh, spaces uh, and galleries that sit astride a dammed uh, creek or bridge across it. 
and this little orange wedge of a circle strange figure is the white space for our museum store. Crystal Bridges as you see it today. Fantastic art collection I might add. The dining room. Uh, uh, there's Bill again. Uh, but we, the things that we were looking at, uh, more importantly, is our, the material culture of this place, the, the raw resources, our hardwood forest, uh, the way in which Faye Jones could use repetition and single, simple elements and repeat them and build energy uh, uh, through them uh, and, 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 and dynamism of space. And, and so we, we began to look at what we could find locally uh, as a way to put forth a proposal that would extend the museum experience into the retail experience. Uh, so here's the empty white shell of a concrete shell full of columns supporting a green roof. Uh, not an ideal space for a com commercial or retail space. And we came up with a, a, a very simple strategy using repetition, using local material, uh, and using new technologies, not the technologies just of the hand, but digital. This entire project is CNC fabricated uh, through a robot. Uh, and this is the Crystal Bridges uh, Museum Store. All made out of local cherry, uh, three-quarter inch plywood, uh, cherry planks, and then walnut for all the vitrines and display cases uh, that you see. So what kind of drove us on this was looking at the work that would be featured in the shop. And we have a very famous basket maker from Huntsville, Arkansas named Leon Niehaus, who makes these beautiful baskets, strips his own white oak bark, uh, uses screws, and they're just elegant. They're in the Smithsonian, they're, they're everywhere uh, uh, in major galleries. And we went to a studio, we talked to him, we began to analyze his own work and look at how he generated his work. And what we discovered is that he generated almost every basket in profile and then would extrude that profile shape, that figure, along a particular path. And then as it closed together, much like you button your shirt or something, something would happen in the way in which it closed on itself as an envelope. Uh, and that provided us, I think, with an operation to think about how we introduced uh, a design into this space. And so my initial sketch was to develop a profile that would begin to uh, uh, baffle the light, the western sun by 40%, begin to allow for merchandise to be embedded into it, allow it to control and diffuse the lighting and all the infrastructure like uh, duct work and sprinklers and create a new environment that would envelop the visitor. And that eventually evolved into a series of ribs, 280 ribs made of anywhere from two to four pieces each. Uh, out of 480 sheets of uh, the plywood that would all be milled on a CNC machine directly from our BIM modeling uh, to, to a local uh, millwork guy who had a three-axis CNC. And this is the array of all those pieces. Because we didn't just work with the radius, we worked with parallel lines across the radius, every single rib is different, customized. If you were to build it by hand, it would have been double the price. So by using the robot, we were able to cut the price, and Miss Walton liked that a lot, because, uh, you know, volume and price. Um, so these are, this is the array of all the pieces. And then uh, working with our, our fellow on the CNC, we could even mill the joinery into it and how they were hung. Everything is, all the DNA is, is, is there early on. And then there it is going into place. Uh, just like building a stone wall, one unit at a time, except we're doing it up in the air. And then, of course, the phenomena of the light baffling through it in the afternoon and the different sort of uh, uh, components in it, it really comes alive as the light baffles through it, whether it's artificial or natural light. We're really great in our office uh, at post-rationalization. Um, an architect, so a guy in the office said, hey, man, this looks like the underside of a mushroom, a lamella. We're like, yeah. So that's, that's what we call it. We call it the lamella. And, uh, you know, again, looking at nature, nature wants to, you know, it kind of radiates out from the stem. That's not what we did. So we just put our plan in there and, and then demonstrated how we use parallel lines to maintain the consistency of the gap. Uh, it, but it was a good, interesting analogy. And then, uh, didn't, and then just kind of laid everything out like little islands or pods, uh, all, all the different furniture that's made out of walnut. 
and then that creates the terrain. Every vitrine, every piece of furniture floats above the floor and allows this wrapper to wrap completely uh, underneath and you really get the sense of the enveloping material. And there's some other parting shots here. And the, the nice thing about this is that um, it went up in three months and it paid for itself in four months and made a very happy client. So good design can also t to mean good business. So, on a completely another trajectory is a project in Gentry, Arkansas. This is a, a project we did for $108 a square foot. It's the least expensive library in the state of Arkansas, new library. And it was done on Main Street in Gentry, a town of 2,500, not a wealthy town. Uh, it has one industry in it, a Little Debbie snack food plant, and it has another company that's called Wild, uh, Wild Country Safari. I, you drive through the landscape and monkeys and ch jump on your car and ostriches chase you and stuff like this. It's a strange place. Uh, kids love it though. And that's it. And uh, Main Street's uh, it had gotten kind of worn down, but the library board was very enlightened. They had a public library that was privately funded, had 8,000 volumes of books. Uh, they had a dream of having a, a true library much bigger with a genealogy department, a way to display artifacts from the city's uh, history, and a community room as well. And they got a building on the corner of Main Street, an old hardware store, a hundred year old hardware store that had not been used for several years for a song. And uh, that's where they wanted to locate their library in town as a seed project that would help generate uh, more development on the Main Street, rather than putting out on the edge of town in a metal building, which is what a lot of towns do. And when we, I first saw the building, this is what I was looking at here, uh, which was a ruin. Uh, all the windows blown out, it had been hit by several storms and tornadoes, the bricks blown off, the corbel art, uh, parapet blown off, they just patched together with whatever they had. And, and so it had accrued a lot of ticks and wrinkles over the last hundred years uh, that really made it a mess in my mind. And I, I, my first thought was, why don't we tear it down and start over to be cheaper? And of course, the head of the library board and the mayor, they were like, oh, no, you can't do that. And I said, why not? I said, well, it's the social and economic hub of our town for years. And the mayor piped in and said, yeah, and I ate barbecued beaver down there uh, on the ground floor when I was a kid. Can't do that. I didn't know you could eat barbecued beaver. But uh, we eat all kinds of things in Arkansas. Uh, so we had to come at it in a different strategy. And so we began to think about this building more as an artifact as a kind of ruin and we thought about everyday objects that might be in this uh, history exhibits like you know where you take a bank safe and the way in which you frame it it, it looks better or a pocket watch or something like that how you frame things uh, elevates them out of the realm of the everyday even though they may be an everyday object and so we came up with a system of detailing uh, that was very simple that actually rather than replace the windows we would actually build outside of them with uh, glass soap bubble like vitrines that would allow you to display uh, you know, certain items in the windows, but uh, also encapsulates the brick cor uh, uh, molding and uh, ornament. And we did that with the storefront, kind of making it much thinner and uh, lighter uh, with uh, doors and with columns, and created a whole new syntax of elements that provided the building, hopefully, uh, not with new form, but with new expressive character. And this is the building today. Uh, this, uh, like I said, was built for $108 a square foot. It took seven years to realize this building. It had to be bid out two or three times because uh, we were in the height of the market. But we kept working at it. Uh, and we were able to build it for about $1.1 million. Now, what the town did to raise the money is they passed a millage on themselves. Uh, uh, and, and then the Little Debbie snack food family gave a quarter of a million and they had just enough money to build it. Uh, and you know, a lot of small town politics involved. Luckily we had a really tough mayor, it's a tough town. Uh, this is the mayor on his motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> and, and he owns a tattoo parlor, so he's tough. Uh, Wes Hogue, he was great, he navigated us all the way through. Uh, and in the end brought the town together rather than put it apart. You can see how it's organized. Uh, the community room on your left, uh, the library stacks and reading areas and children's areas, and then up above 
library, genealogy, uh, and, and uh, historical artifacts. There's a Little Debbie Pocket Park on the left side here, a plaza in the back, and then a future home for an antique fire truck. And, and here's the kit apart. The drawing just shows the, the, the kind of kit apart, like an old children carburetor uh, drawing with all the different components that we developed. And those components were a total of about $50,000, more than if we just used Conier. So what we had to sell this town on is that for $1.1 million, instead of for $1.50,000, you can get an amazing building. And, you know, they bought that. And this is it today. And very simple systems. The lateral bracing for the steel structural fins is also uh, where they put new books and journals. This is on the north side. Creates a very uh, uh, seamless interface between the public street and the reading area. So it really, uh, really turns the institution inside out. Uh, locally made furniture. A press tin ceiling that was taken down by county prison workers, the mayor employed. Uh, by direct order, and uh, they labeled all of this. It, it was restored. We weren't allowed to penetrate with lights or HVAC. Uh, so what we did is we the new columns became beacons as well. We wrapped them in books, uh, put the new columns and wrapped it in glass, and put light in the bottom, and it bounces off the ceiling and creates deflected or diffused lighting uh, for the reading areas. The old mechanical lift becomes an exhibit for the old buggies they used to sell. The hardware store. All the heart pine wood floors were redone and, and patched up, just left as they as they are. Uh, so again, the ticks and wrinkles that have accrued, uh, just like in uh, the face of your grandmother or something, become that distinguishing feature. It gives character. And taking a a, a simple window uh, and, and and then infilling it with a light box that. Uh, allows the spiritual to become part of a kind of more prosaic uh, condition. And the thing about the project that uh, uh, I think we uh, had get the greatest satisfaction from is that when this project started in 2000, uh, they had 300 library card holders in a town of 2,500. Uh, today they have over 2,300 library card holders in a town of 2,500. So it illustrates the, the power of design and, and it's to transform uh, through its institutions uh, a, a city and a place uh, and has become a real true center for the, for the city. In a similar way, we approached uh, an existing library in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the, the Fayetteville Library built in the 60s by Warren Seagraves. Uh, the library had moved to the other side of downtown and just became an empty building. Uh, developers bought it and wanted to turn it into 30,000 square feet of new office space. And of course it had to be totally transformed. We were, it was the best civic building in Northwest Arkansas in my opinion. So we uh, transformed that building for 120 bucks a square foot. Uh, we totally changed the way in which light comes through the perimeter because it's no longer for books but for people. Uh, and. Uh, really came up with a, a good uh, economic way to rent all of the floors for the same uh, price per square foot. You can see the different additions over time. Uh, it's a mat building, two floors, kind of dark down below, so we cut uh, actual uh, stairwells and courtyards into the building and surrounded the, that with tenants and stacked the tenants two floors and, and, and created a, a way in which you could rent all of the building and created this nice little courtyard. And this then after a few years became our new offices here. This used to be outdoor space, so we just glassed that in. And by glassing it in, we got a courtyard that makes it feel like it's our own, even though we don't pay rent on it. So some pictures above of the uh, existing library and how we cored through the roof and the floors without moving any structure to create uh, these, these spaces, double volume spaces that would organize the tenant's spaces on the inside. We also added 2,500 square feet on one end for uh, another tenant uh, and then uh, connected uh, a red stair to uh, the parking lot so they'd have a separate entry. This is a Wells Fargo, it's a, a brokerage firm. 
And this is a stair that's literally hung from the steel structure, floats just above the ground. Uh, and then this joint really acts as a joint, a formal joint between the old building and the new building. And, and then the spaces inside are really just very simple with uh, drywalls, uh, translucent and colored glass that develops an independent relationship with the universal grid of the, uh, of the structure. And it's just a series of interventions and episodes uh, that kind of highlight uh, and intensify different aspects of the existing building. And then the, the big move was to, that the owners wanted was one conference space that all this office could use and the community could use as a community room. So that space was built in the 90s for handicap ramps and stairs. We, we, uh, you see it on your, left, on your right as you cross the bridge into the main entry. Uh, and so this becomes the conference room. Uh, and we hung uh, in this conference room what I like to call an acoustical shroud out of black zinc. Uh, it's a figure, much like a, a, we call it the ship in the bottle. And it's, it's this upside down boat that kind of works to make the room perform acoustically. It was built by two artists uh, on the inside who hung from the, from the rafter, so to speak. And you can see on your left the existing uh, building, how it looked before. And then it's all fed with fiber optics and lights the room, the sprinklers are there, a a AC, everything. And all the walls are canted a little bit for acoustics. It makes a really great place for wine tastings or just depositions. And then at night, it's of course lit up and becomes this shadowy figure on the street uh, in the historic neighborhood that it sits. So it's, a, again, another opportunity for public interface uh, with, the, with the neighbors around. Two more projects, I, and uh, we're going to let you go here. So in this spirit, in the spirit of taking the world as you find it, taking the flotsam and jetsam, uh, of the world and transforming it through the act of design. We recently completed a church for Christian Orthodox uh, folks in Springdale, Arkansas. And uh, like many of our projects, they come with cows and chickens. Uh, this is located right on the interstate between Fayetteville and Springdale amongst a host of other mega churches, or, or mega churches, it's not a mega church. This is a congregation of about 70 people. But you can see the big red churches. Uh, one of their members died, uh, left them $450,000. So they took $300,000 and bought a three-acre site. They took the other money, borrowed a little bit from the bank, and decided that they would build them a sanctuary and fellowship hall. Uh, they wanted to spend $100 a square foot, so about uh, 3,500 square feet. And uh, this is what they wanted to build, something like this. Uh, which we had to inform them that uh, they were in the realm of, you know, these are adventures in religious architecture in Arkansas, right here. And, which I find kind of funny uh, to me is, you know, metal buildings with crosses hung on them. You know, I've seen people pull up who's, again, whose cars cost more than the building, and I, and I can assure you they don't live in these types of buildings. It's kind of a funny idea about worship the, that you can, this is what you offer up as a gift. Uh, Everybody has a different take on that, but certainly in the traditions of the, uh, the more aesthetic and ritualized worship of the Orthodox Christians, this would not work. But we had a dilemma, uh, and the dilemma was is this is what we had to start with. This is a, a welding shop adjacent to the house that they had bought, and that's where they wanted to start. I said, oh, well, we can tear it down, we can start over. No, we don't have the money. I was like, well, you can't have that other thing. And I said, yeah, we know. So what are we going to do? So our entry into this was through principles, through the classical Greek proportioning system that is a kind of, in many ways, at the root of a lot of their uh, structures, their religious structures over time, thousands of years, the Christian Orthodox have used this. So uh, what we came up with is a church that uses these principles and develops a, a very harmonious facade out of this metal building. We add 10 foot to it and give it a, a, a prominence, a profile and figure facing the interstate that can be seen uh, from a distance, but also has a dignified presence uh, at the street and greets people, uh, you know, uh, for worship. 
and simple diagram that shows adding of a narthex in the steeple. The narthex allows us to move north-south so we can get back on the east-west axes for the sanctuary. There's also a uh, fellowship hall and an operable walls that allow for overspill during holiday uh, services and also connection between the sanctuary and the fellowship hall for socializing. And we just rewrapped the skin, so the building's still there. This is a true American double skin system. Europe, eat your heart out. This is the view from the city park that sits behind it. Very controlled lighting. We didn't have a money for a lot of openings. But we used just a simple box rib system, off the rack system you can get, and we course it just like brick. So when you turn a corner, you don't see trim on our buildings. It's just part of the coursing. And we calibrate everything on the front end so that there is a level of craft in its execution that elevates it, we believe, uh, to a higher status uh, of architecture for 100 bucks a square foot. Uh, so the simple diagram, lit at night, comes alive. And the section where everything is strung together, the uh, office of Father John up above, the narthex, this is the return air duct. It's actually a cabinet with a, a steel tray filled with sand and candles. And then the blood of Christ that washes on you as you come into the main axis below the steeple into the sanctuary. You can see this as you come in. You move towards the, uh, the steeple, and then stand underneath, and then into the uh, the different aspects of the, the color and what it does in the space. And then to the sanctuary, very simple, modest space, chairs, not unlike a room like this, has a dome, has its iconostasis and all the icons and the altar, all the things they need to worship uh, in a dignified way. And that icon, or, or that iconostasis is designed to be very transparent to allow them to uh, watch the uh, Father John as he conducts services. One of the big things that they had to have was a dome. We couldn't put a dome on the outside because you'd have to cut through this major structure. They couldn't afford that. So we convinced them to have us a, let them have a dome on the inside. The problem was they couldn't afford a dome. And uh, we tried to spec one, it was too expensive. And finally our contractor came up with a really great idea. He said, look, I know a guy that for two cases of beer, uh, we can trade it and we can get us a satellite dish. Uh, so, that's what we did. So we went out, we traded some beer, we got a satellite dish, we, we brought it back. And of course, the satellite dish is its own natural lath. So we were able to replaster it and put it up. And uh, uh, let's see, see how it came out. Oh, here it is. And there it is. Got our dome with a pantocrator. And one of the guys on the building committee got all excited about this when he saw the dome go in. He goes, you know what? I know where we can get a, a, a bishop's chair. A, a heavy, like a, it's like a throne, it's wood, and it's got crushed purple velvet uh, upholstery, and we can get it for free. And I said, wow, wh where can you get that? And he goes, well, it's at a local liquor store, it's part of an ad campaign. Um, I said, uh, well, okay, and I mean, and he said, well, I just don't know what we're gonna do about the embroidered CR on it. And I, I said, what do, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, Crown Royal. <laughs> and Father John piped in, he said, oh no, Christ the Redeemer. So, this, this is how we roll. Very resourceful. Uh, and as Jay mentioned, this one, uh, the world's best, was voted world's best civic and community building uh, at the Barcelona uh, World Architecture Festival in 11, and was uh, the winner, of, uh, one of the winners of this year's 2013 AIA National Honor Awards. When we got the phone call in January, uh, Elizabeth Henry, who's head of the ward, said, I, I, I want to confess to you, uh, this is the least expensive building that's ever won a National Honor Award. So we're like, great. So it goes to show you that architecture can happen anywhere, right, for almost any budget, for almost any building type. So the last project I want to share with you, I appreciate your patience. I'm talking as fast as I can for a Southern guy. Uh, I am the director of the Faye Jones School of Architecture. We had the very good fortune, I can't go into it, but we got the commission 
along with Polk Stanley Wilcox in Arkansas to do the new Bay Jones School of Architecture, the renovation of 70,000 square feet to our existing Beaux-Arts building and the addition of 35,000 square feet uh, to create a home for not only architecture but landscape and interiors to be underneath the same roof for the first time in 40 years. Uh, it's a project we've been working on for three years. It's going to open in three months. We're really excited about it. Todd Williams, Billy Shin are coming to kind of help dedicate it and it's uh, it's it's a it's a major work on campus. It's our largest uh, project, uh, and uh, we, I want to share a little bit of it with you. It's right in the center of campus, right on the main axis of campus. We've been there for 40 years in this what was the library and uh, was built back in the 30s. Uh, there's Old Main that you saw in that early slide here, uh, and this axis runs all the way through the campus to the football field. The problem was is that. Once you got into our building, you always had to go around and come back out. You, know, you couldn't stay on the axis because that was filled with books and it was too small for people. So, at least in the lower levels, which you had to, which is at the ground level. So, we came up with a strategy of coring out the middle, adding a bar, the same width and length as the neoclassical bar, and creating a kind of male-female connection there uh, in the campus and opening it up uh, uh, the entire uh, campus community to uh, experience uh, the architecture school. And there's a diagram that kind of shows you that, that simple strategy. And we discovered that there were berms that were supposed to be part of the original building and we decided we could bring those back. So this landscape plan includes that. And it's, uh, uh, you begin to, to see it here. So this is it. So it's a new structure the old structure that uses some of the same principles that the old structure does, but does it with new technologies. So clearly they can't be the same. And this is it today under construction. Uh, a view from another side of campus as it sort of situates itself into the context and scale of the campus. It's all done out of Indiana limestone rain screen to complement the Indiana limestone of the existing building. We also have Batesville limestone from Arkansas in the existing. We couldn't find that, but we, we have architectural concrete that's matched to that color. We're working with Peter Clarkson, who did the uh, uh, Ando's Pulitzer Museum in the Chicago house. He's our concrete consultant, so we're, we're getting some nice uh, concrete. This is a post-tension concrete structure. There's a 200 foot of west-facing facade. I can, uh, that we had to contend with, the light where all the studios are, or new studios and auditorium and conference rooms. So we, we looked at how light moved around the site and of course how to deal with that west facade. So we came up with the idea of a custom uh, briselet, fritted st uh, glass briselet over a custom steel and glass uh, curtain wall system. Uh, by separating the warranties between the steel guys and the glass guys, we cut about $2 million out of it. So we have steel and glass, no Conair, and, and no offense to Conair, I use them on most of my projects, but this, this is an existing building with original steel sashes and single pane glass. We wanted to have a similar kind of character. So we were able to do that just through some customization and building it locally. And some full scale mock-ups that we like to do to gotta get a feel for how the briselet would work. And, and then inside you get this nice translucency but also views back towards the north. This is one of the, the studios with its plenum floor, it's all cork. And then this view here. So the, it's almost complete in terms of the, the briselet. And then from the southwest, uh, the whole understory of this thing is an exhibit gallery, auditorium, and it slides out for an events deck up above uh, with a, an outdoor classroom at the top and all the studios. Now, to get past the design review board was a big challenge. And so what we try to do is treat the building as a didactic moment, as a learning tool for students to be able to see how we once built and to see how we build today and we kind of compare and contrast. So we use the idea of the figure ground to demonstrate this, that in these heavier buildings, in these older buildings, the, the, the figure ground relationship was established primarily by the, the, the building mass being the ground for the Beaux-Arts and the windows being more the figure. In our building, which is more layered uh, and, and, and frame-like, we've taken the building and we've made 
the mass, the figure, and the windows and the fenestration, the ground. So there's a kind of inversion uh, that begins to speak to weight, uh, begins to speak to uh, technology and how we bring light in. And then, and then some views of uh, the building as it's under construction now. And then just a few interior spaces. Again, we had to core out the middle in order to get to the older part of the building. We, everything we did is on BIM. We, we measured everything in the old building and the new building is all in a BIM model. We won, last year this won the National uh, BIM Award for Small Practices. Uh, we committed our own cloud sharing system with our partner firm. But it really a, a, saved a lot of money uh, knowing where things are at. This is the existing central gallery where the old and new come together. You can see how it once looked. This is how it will look. It's floors, the whole ceiling is fabric. So it lights up like a lampshade, resolves all our lighting problems. It's perforated, lights are, resolves our acoustic problems. We cored out a, a nine foot by 20 foot oculus with studios up above with one piece of glass from Germany that uh, frames the sky, this blue sky, uh, and then Arkansas red, level five finished drywall. Uh, red and blue, it'll be cool. And under construction. And that skylight animates the studios up above. Uh, the re original reading room, which is here, uh, becomes a, a studio space for all disciplines to be united under. This is the rented custom fixtures, custom desk. It's all under construction now as well. Uh, our 200-seat auditorium, all out of gray felt uh, fabric, carpet that wraps it in a tray, and then rift cut uh, red stained plywood, and then red leather uh, chairs. And then we, we dropped Faye Jones in here in the rendering. Chancellor loved that. Concrete space. And then the outdoor classroom, our final space here. A place really for refuge and prospect and for to students to learn in, to socialize in, and for faculty and students to come together. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm, I'm told I'm supposed to take some questions. So. Yep. You have uh, uh, ably shown us that good design doesn't have to be expensive. You also showed us like the example of the, of the library project that good design actually draws more people in and causes more community engagement. So my question is, how could Walgreens and CVS have to be so darn <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. I, I wish I. If why hasn't corporate America gotten it? Why isn't a Sam? Why is that the Walmart on 72nd Street looks like a dead building at night? Because yeah. Just, I mean, why have they thought through the idea of having the creating something that's engaging that doesn't have? To, that, you, know, you use the, yeah. the metal building in the church. Example, right. Um, you know, to be alive and interesting and engaging. Yeah. Yet you don't seem to see anybody in break, very few large entities embracing this on a mass scale. Yeah. Well, I think there's uh, is not necessarily part of their business model. You know, I, I don't, first of all, I don't think we come from a culture of beauty. Uh, I think we've come, uh, we're a much more pragmatic type culture. Uh, uh, we like to talk about poetic pragmatism, you know, where, you know, you're solving things through common sense, you know, if you think about the philosophy of William James, you know, where every decision is governed by a consequence. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where, uh, yeah, where I was talking about, I just, I veered off into philosophy with William James, but you know, uh, you know, a kind of pragmatism. I think that, that feeds a lot of what we do. If it fits in the business model, great. If they can pr prove that Walmarts that look better uh, are gonna sell more stuff, I guarantee it'll happen. They are, uh, I know, uh, they are trying to make them perform better, uh, to be a, a better steward, let's say, of, uh, 
of, uh, of how they use the land, uh, how they use materials, those sorts of things. So that's a kind of commodification, too, of that movement that makes it appear to be better. But in terms of aesthetics, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you because uh, they have not put the investment. Most of these corporations do it uh, in-house, and the idea of volume and repetition and all that forms not only the business model but every aspect of the company. Uh, so if you go to the headquarters of Walmart, uh, you're not going to see amazing uh, buildings. It, it's a rabbit warren of metal buildings, essentially, uh, in downtown Bentonville. They don't want to spend the money. So it's, it's a, I don't have an easy answer for it. I've seen projects that have proposed how you could use uh, retention ponds at Walmart for ice skating rinks and turn them into, you know, parking on the roof and all these other different things. But I, I, I'm not, I, I don't think they've seen any negative, uh, shopping overcomes everything, I guess, you know. It's, what, how, how much is it? Uh, whereas, when I think you talk about institutions, churches, uh, uh, schools, and uh, other types of projects like that, there, there is a kind of different take on that. Because there is something, I don't know, maybe as a culture that we separate commercial activity from institutional activity, uh, perhaps. And so the idea of uh, the fundamental civic dignity of all things son doesn't apply to certain things in our culture. I think. Otherwise, we would demand that it would. Uh, and, in, and in some cases, what I've tried to hint at is it doesn't even apply to our institutions. So whether it's a church or a school, it's, we seem to be somewhat content for it to be operating at the lowest level. That's turning off a lot of people. They're out of here now. So. <laughs> but I love America, really. So I don't know. And, and that, yes? Uh, budget's a big part of it. Also, uh, who we know is building it. Uh, so that, that's, that's very important. Um, we just, we're doing a high school I didn't share, share with you tonight with the DLR and uh, uh, Height Jackson. And, you know, it's off-the-shelf metal panels, but the stone is naturally quarried. So we just combine those two. And that stone is expensive, but there's so much of the metal that it offsets right so it's it's really a strategic way to up quality uh, so that's it really boils down to quality you know what 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 level of quality can we get in a project for this price point uh, that's how we decide and we also the other thing we try to do any kind of customization we do we do it on the front end so we have subcontractors in before we even talk to generals uh, helping us figure out how to do it and do it for an economical price. I just, where I'm from, I imagine it's not wildly different, Nebraska, you know, $200 a square foot is our sweet spot. You may, we can do a lot for that. But if you go to other parts of the country or other types of furniture, it's very difficult. Uh, we've just gotten conditioned because people will not spend the money uh, beyond that. So if, if you can't do good design in that, then you're, you know, if you gotta have a big budget to do good design, you may not be that good. Yes. Right, how it performs. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it gets back. I mean, I, and chicken houses are probably not the best thing to use, but it gets back to the. Uh, if you see the you know whole chicken process, it can be kind of gross. But th the point is, is that there's an environmental pragmatism, right, that comes with why we do things. Site orientation can resolve 80 percent of your energy issues. So we try to orient things properly. We try to ventilate if we can. We try to. Uh, shade properly, you know, these big porches in some cases, the brisole, everything to cut the energy down. You know, we're lead, you know, we, everybody, we do lead just like anybody else. Most, several of these projects we show you are, are lead. I just don't talk about it that way because, uh, but yeah, performance is a big thing and performance is something that I think we used to as 
a profession have to initiate, I'm finding more and more that the people we're working with initiate it in the other direction. They want it to perform and they're willing to invest in it uh, to do so. But it's all, again, it's back to being pragmatic. It's a life cycle cost analysis. Does it make sense? Uh, one of the things about the exist this architecture school, the old building, the reason it's single pane glass with steel sash, that's what we wanted, but we had to prove it to the university. So we did a life cycle cost analysis to take out all the windows and put in uh, double glaze and triple glaze glass to get it up to the energy uh, uh, you know, quotients that they wanted. We found that the payback was 360 years on energy savings. So rather than do that, we just came up with solar shades on the inside that operate with the sun that come down and allows you to keep the original character of the glass. So it, it, you know, you lose a little bit on performance, but you gain something in integrity of the building that you, you that would be lost forever. Uh, so it, it's it's a negotiation. It's a, it's a, again a kind of pragmatic approach to optimize, yeah, you know, that 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 situation. Yes. You could approach it that way. I mean, for most people, an architect already means money, right? I mean, versus Joe Ugots and his hammer, you know. Uh, so I mean, we're 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 sometimes seen as a a luxury. Uh, you know, you have to make the case that we actually, you know, we create value in what we do. And that sounds like a platitude, but th we're constantly doing that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we know what a budget is, and we know we try to work with it. And we may come in over budget, uh, but we're going to get it into budget. The, the key is how to maintain the design, the origins of the design, uh, through its execution and working with those realities of called value analysis and, and other sorts of things. But I think you could market it that way. Uh, yeah. Well, it's like the office building. I showed you the alternative suburban office building. That building cost $140 a square foot, which the adjacent buildings that all look like brick houses cost 120 So it was $20 more a square foot, uh, plus the fee. So you probably have to add another, you know, make it $30 a square foot. They would have to pay more. So they're going to pay more, but they're going to get more. But then you've got to have banks get on board, too. Because the banks are, to me, are the big, they're the scary monsters in all of this. Because they can't find a comp, it don't matter how good it looks or what it is, it's just like everything else. So, you know, we've, we've got to challenge them as well. That's who I'd rather be selling it to, is to the banks and say, hey, look, we're get, can, you, can you appraise this and quit appraising it based on, you know, some, what some real estate sold six months ago, real estate uh, uh, agent. Really thoroughly exhausted. Okay. Thank you.